So I'm a pediatrician by training. I started out my career in the South Bronx working in a community health center and expected that that's what I would do for the rest of my life. Um, and I found out pretty quickly that all the training I had in medical school and residency didn't prepare me to address the needs that children and families had. Okay, so I'll just say How pathetic am I, really? Um, so uh, so I, I just decided to get more training to learn about child development and to learn more about the things that affect children's lives. I found the clicker. Okay, thank you. Uh, too many things in my pocket. Uh, and so I, and I got... I got seduced into academia, I couldn't help it, but I, um, I ran a division of developmental and behavioral pediatrics that had community-based programs focused on the early childhood period. So I, my roots are in community-based direct service delivery, both as a pediatrician and um, community services, and I just kind of, over time, thought of myself as a recovering pediatrician and wanted to get more involved in the policy world and um, actually started to meet some scientists who were, there's Jim Shelton's point about surround yourself by people smarter than you. And I got really seduced by the revolution in 21st century biology, which uh, I spent most of my time over the last two decades trying to make more accessible and actionable in the, in the policy arena. So the last thing I want to say as an introduction is I've, I've, I've been a, a kind of an admirer from a little bit of a difference because my roots are in kind of community-based uh, and place-based work, um, and was always trying to pay attention to, so how could there be an early childhood dimension to that, which is kind of part of why I'm here. But I'll have to tell you a little bit of a spoiler alert. Um, I think the future of early childhood policy and programs is the extent to which it gets embedded in a place-based approach. I think if it just continues to focus primarily on families and people who are raising children, I'll talk about this, um, it's not enough. We really, it's, uh, families don't raise their children in a vacuum, as everybody here knows. So I'm gonna give you basically a crash course in 21st century biology, uh, recognizing that there's a pretty ugly history of biology being in bed with racist thinking for hundreds of years. So it's a little bit of a, of a potential third rail of saying that biology is something that we should bring to the table because it, um, it can trigger a lot of kind of bad thoughts. So I want you to um, listen. I'm looking forward to the feedback on how this can be empowering. That's, that's the basic agenda that we have in our center and the work that we do. We want to make the, the leading edge of the revolution in 21st century biology uh, another, an, a very powerful arrow in the quiver of people who are doing place-based work to basically say that there's, there's value in empowering that kind of information without overstating where the, where the, where the, the limits are of uh, biology. So um, from my perspective, when I think about early childhood and think about investment in the prenatal and early childhood periods, and by the way, uh, one plea I'll make is uh, please don't say zero to three or zero to five. Uh, because that implies that uh, everything starts at birth, and that's not remotely the case. Okay? Um, but basically, there are three lenses that I bring to this. I started with just looking at this as, duh, it's a moral responsibility, and I've never lost that as being at the center of, um, of what's dri driving my work, but at least in this country, uh, that doesn't take you far enough. Uh, so I started over the years to kind of uh, take a deep breath and try to listen to what the business community was saying and economists about the return on investment. And actually, I wish I had listened to that earlier because they actually, um, there are some things that they're smart about that would be good to know about. So the tent got bigger, um, that this is a moral imperative. And uh, also, it's, it's just smart in terms of investing in, um, in the future health and competence and, and productivity of our population. But here's, here's where my talk is going to share with you this afternoon is um, the third piece, which is the untapped, and I want to emphasize untapped power of continuing advances in science and lived experiences and bringing them together at the table. I think science, and I'll kind of share that with you in a moment, has a lot of potentially very valuable knowledge to be mobilized and used in the service of all the things we've been talking about in this incredibly inspiring day. It's really been amazing to be uh, in, in the room in the audience for these presentations. Um, but if we've learned, among the things we all should have learned from the pandemic is that even in the face of some remarkably rapidly produced scientific advances, um, they don't actually, um, they, they're not enough if people don't trust science 
and have deeply embedded historical reasons to not trust science, or they have political reasons to just kind of want to disabuse science. So there's also a tremendous amount of knowledge in the lived experience. And we talk about it in the field, we talk about the lived experience of families raising children, which is clearly important, but there's also the lived experience of people working in programs and the lived experience of people developing policies and all the other players. So that's where I think the power is to see, let's get science at the table, but not, not expect it to kind of have all the answers. Let's make sure all of the right lived experiences at the table. And also remember, as a number of people have alluded to, is a very powerful story, a very powerful anecdote will completely wipe out some fancy analytic presentation uh, in any kind of political arena. I think we all understand that. So um, I'm going to start with the brain story, but say very little about it because that's kind of the old news. Okay, so um, I think most people in the field have kind of gotten the, the message that early experiences literally shape the development of the brain and that positive responsive environments shape strong brain circuits and excessive stress activation of what we call toxic stress can disrupt brain development. Um, and why, why is that so important and why is that foundational to the early childhood period? because of the story in this very simple schematic. So when we talk about the plasticity of the brain, its adaptability, its kind of, its ability to kind of adjust and react to new challenges and develop new circuits, it's optimally adaptive and plastic at birth, and it pretty dramatically drops in the first couple of years in terms of its adaptability. Um, and then the rate of, of the adaptability, plasticity kind of dropping slows down, I mean, the first thing everybody does when this slide goes up is you look for your age, right? <laughs> um, so let me, let me just reassure you that a couple of things. One is that notice this never goes to zero. I mean, it goes to zero when you have a flat line EEG when you die. Um, so that we're always capable of learning new things. Our brain is always capable of making adaptations. But the cost to the brain to kind of have to make adaptations later um, the physiological cost, literally how much oxygen and blood supply it needs to kind of create new connections goes up. So the, the take home message here is um, there's a lot of foundational circuitry being built early. You'll have that for the rest of your life. You'll continue to build more circuits on top of it. Um, it's always better to get it right the first time than to try to fix it later. Um, it's never too late to kind of uh, try to adapt new skills. It's, you know, we're kind of in July. It's better in January to say, this is the biological explanation for why the same New Year's resolutions every year don't work. You know, this year I'm going to exercise more and I'm going to eat better. It's not that we're not motivated. It's just it's very hard to change the patterns that our brain has developed. So it's not only physiologically more costly. It costs in money. It costs more to try to fix things later that would have been better if we had done it right earlier. And it's never as good as it would have been if we had gotten it right the first time. So... That's all I'm going to say about what's been the science dimension of the early childhood field for the last 15 or 20 years. And basically say that there's been a lot of new scientific uh, discoveries, particularly over the last 15 or 20 years. And what I'm going to talk about now is advances in understanding the biology of adversity and resilience. And that is deepening our understanding of the early childhood roots of both early learning and, and school achievement and development and lifelong physical and mental health. And there are three take home messages, three simple concepts that I'm gonna put out here now in the beginning and then I'll go a little bit deeper and I'll give you this crash course in molecular biology. Trust me, you'll, you'll kind of, you'll know, you'll know a hunk of what's important about that in about 10 minutes. Um, so three concepts. First, yes, everything we've, we've all been hearing and learning about how early experiences affect the brain is as true now as it was when it was first put out in the public arena, but the brain is connected to the rest of the body. The brain is connected to the immune system, it's connected to metabolic systems. All of these systems are highly interrelated, and so the importance of early experiences is not just about the brain. I'll kind of say a little bit about, actually I'll say a lot more about that in a second. The next take home message, and this is a critical one, for us to address this issue of how do we improve the impacts? How do we increase the impacts of what we're doing? Basic biology, this is by the way, a lot of this research comes from animal studies too. It's basic biology. Um, variation in sensitivity to the environment. Um, at a scientific level, it means that everything is about gene environment interaction. 
There's nothing that's genetic. None of the things we talk about are kind of genetically predetermined at all. And nothing, nothing about the environment in which we live has the same impact on everybody. Okay? It's the interaction between the two. The simple example of that that everyone will completely understand, if any of you um, have more than one child, or any of you grew up in a family with more than one child, or know somebody in a family where there's more than one child, you know, even if these two or more children have the same parent and they live in the same home, they're different. They're different in how sensitive they are to what's going on. They're different. Some kids are just kind of more um, responsive and susceptible to, to kind of stresses, and some seem to just like whatever and go on. And, that's, and that is about our kind of differences. The only person who is genetically the same as you is if you have a gen an identical twin. But in everybody else, we're all different. Okay? Very important. I'm going to come back to two examples about this in a few minutes. And the third issue is the importance of timing in critical periods. Um, a lot of this has been known for a long time in brain development, that there are certain things that happen in very well-defined early periods of development when those circuits are being made. And if the environment is and the experiences are, are positive and responsive, you build strong circuits. And if it's not, the circuits can be weak. And then the brain moves on to new circuits. It doesn't go back and rewire. That's also true for the immune system. It's also true for metabolic systems. Examples, some very concrete examples. And studied in many countries, the impact of famine, of, of, of malnutrition during pregnancy. Uh, people who are pregnant in, in times of, or have diminished access to adequate nutrition, on average, have babies with lower birth weights. Common sense, a lot of fancy science to explain that. Um, because of the fact that there was inadequate nutrition. But if in, after the pregnancy, and particularly in the early years, if there's adequate nutrition, not overfeeding, but adequate nutrition, there's a higher rate of obesity in those children. Why? Because early on, every biological system is reading the environment, trying to be prepared to be optimally adaptive. And so if the environment prenatally says inadequate nutrition, the metabolic systems are gearing up to conserve as much as possible. And some of those patterns are pretty fixed early on and hard to change. You can't go back. It's not like the environment suddenly changed and the systems changed because they were preparing to keep you alive long enough to reproduce. That's all biology cares about. So these three concepts, I'm going to go a little bit deeper now. Um, and I, I'm serious about this. You're going to you're going to know more about what's going on inside the body in the face of adversity and how resilience kind of helps to protect that. And uh, this is the purpose of this is to say we need some new ways of thinking about things in the work that we do. And science is not going to have all the new ways, but these could be interesting new ways of thinking along with the knowledge that's been built on the ground to say what should we be doing differently because everyone in one way or another all through this day has wonderfully underscored the fact that we need to not be complacent in what we do and we should not in any way say we have all the answers, we need new ideas. Okay. So um, I'm going to basically, if any of you are interested, there's more material on this on our website and you can do more reading on it, but I'm going to give you highlights of this. We have been looking at how much the science has moved in the last 15 years to say that it's, it's so much so that not only has it reinforced what we've already known, but actually we need a mindset shift by what we mean when we say science-informed early childhood policy. And that has to be informed by both rigorous science and lived experience, not just science. Okay. Here are some of the basic differences in what it's been and where it needs to go. Um, so we have now labeled what's been the science of early childhood policy ECD, Early Childhood Development 1.0. That's about early brain development, and it's about the environment of relationships in which children are growing up. It's as powerfully correct now as it's ever been, it's, but there's more science, so now we need to expand the story of what is the relevant science. So we're now kind of beginning to talk about what we're calling ECD 2.0, which is building on 1.0, not, not replacing it, but saying we have to connect the brain to the rest of the body, and we have to look at development in a broader ecology than just looking at child development and the adults who interact with the child. Like maybe place matters, right? 
Okay. So four take-home messages on what we mean by this new science. Number one, it's still about readiness to succeed in school. I mean, that's, there's no less what it's all about now than it's ever been, but it's also about the early life origins of physical and mental health over a lifetime. And I'll explain what that means for you in the next slide. But uh, the, the practical implications of this, um, if we're gonna really mine the knowledge we have about early childhood in a larger context and think about um, the power of place, the financial responsibilities, it shouldn't just be on the poor back of the Department of Education. The departments of health need to kind of step to the table. This is as much about what's gonna cost the healthcare system as later, as much as it will about uh, diminished academic achievement. The second dimension is it's still about providing enrichment for developing minds. Yes, we have all of this work that's been done on the importance of talking to young children, reading to them, rich learning experiences, early care and education programs provide these enriched environments. Yes, 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 yes. However, it's also not just about providing enrichment, it's about protecting developing brains and other biological systems from the disruptive effects of chronic adversity. And in fact, if we look at this issue of why, this, we've, this has been implied through the day, but um, I wanna name it now, is that we all know, every one of us knows, that wherever you work, uh, every day you see examples of where you're making a big difference in the lives of, of children and youth and families, and also see every day where you're not making as big a difference as you'd like. And that, that relates to why we're not getting more progress at a population level. It's like, well, for many children in the early childhood period, it may not be that the enrichment isn't enough. It's that we're not doing enough to protect them so that they can benefit from the enriched experiences. The third principle is it's still about the hardships of poverty. Early childhood field began in the war on poverty in the 1960s. It's always in, talked about in a poverty lens. We need to name racism and say this is, this is as much about racism as it is about poverty. And they're not, they're often intertwined, but they're not the same. Right? And, that's, and that's obviously we need a lot of work on this equity agenda. And also, it's still about nurturing relationships. Yes, this is critically important, but it's also about building a health, promoting a health enhancing society and going upstream, which the early childhood field has not really done very much. So from my perspective, the work that you're all doing and my interest in finding a way to kind of connect more to the work you're doing is because you hold the key to where early childhood needs to go. It needs to not just kind of be off and think about how do we connect it to kind of um, place-based initiatives and, and K-12 education and youth programs, but how do we actually unleash what early child can do by paying more attention to these larger issues and not just focusing on adult child interaction. So this is the slide I'm gonna to try to go through pretty quickly, but this is the heart of your crash course in molecular biology, okay? It's so understand this is about how stress gets into the body and what's going on. Everybody in this room knows what it feels like physically to be stressed, right? Whenever, whatever stresses you, um, you know, you feel it physically. It's not just what you're thinking, you feel it physically. I'm gonna open up the hood and take you inside and tell you why you're feeling those things, right? Um, but to start with this idea that Stress um, is not all bad. Uh, we can't eliminate stress from our lives. Um, it's a normal experience. The issue is where is stress beneficial and where is it harmful? And this has to do with how the stress response system works. So really quickly, whirlwind tour. When we are stressed, first let me reemphasize, this is all about individual genetic variation. How, what does it take to trigger your stress system? Is it on a hair, is it on a hair trigger? Does it take a little bit of a while? Uh, what are the stressors in your environment and how old are you? It matters whether you're one month old or one year old or three years old or five years old. Um, and this affects all learning behavior and physical mental health. So the stress system is activated in an acute situation, an acute threat. It can be like a, a deadline approaching for a grant proposal. It can be a, a personnel issue in your program. It could be dealing with some serious problems in your community, in your life. Here's what's going inside your body. Uh, your stress hormone levels are going up. Cortisol is one of the, the, the stress hormones that's best well known. Um, and what is it doing? It's making, it's making your, the front part of your brain on high alert and it's actually helping you think more clearly in an acute situation of threat. 
it's activating the fight or flight response. Okay, it's a very important uh, control mechanism. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Some of you might feel palpitations. That's, this is good, this is, this is good, this is life saving. Okay. Um, your inflammatory system is activated. Um, your heart rate is blood pressure is sending more blood to more parts of the body, your muscles so you can fight or run if that's what you have to do to your brain to be more alert. The inflammatory system is already preparing for the possibility you're gonna be injured and is on, now on alert to kind of fight infection if you're cut or work on wound healing. It's not waiting, it's kind of it's there, ready. Um, your metabolic system is on fire. It's, it's pumping out glucose and, and, and increasing insulin to get the glucose into the cells to give you energy for dealing with an acute stress. And um, I'll say something about this later, not right now. Um, and your brain circuits are in, in the fear parts of the brain, your brain circuits are kind of overactivated. And all of this in an acute situation is what's great about the stress response. It helps you be more effective in running, fighting, or thinking fast and doing what you're doing. And then it's supposed to come back to baseline after the acute situation is gone. It was designed to be uh, protective in the face of an acute threat. It was not designed to be activated a lot of the time. And when it's activated a lot of the time, and please don't ask me how long that is because I don't really know, it's not days. You know, it's not like if you have a couple of bad days, don't worry. It's like if, if, if your life is consumed with significant stress and that's what it's like for your stress system most of the time. So then all of these things that are protecting you in an acute situation are suddenly kind of uh, turning inside and having a wear and tear effect on the body. So stress hormones, cortisol, if it stays up high, it actually starts to suppress the immune system. Um, it can produce osteoporosis. It can, over, it can over stimulate the fear circuits in the brain and it can disrupt in very young children some of the circuits involved in simple learning and memory as they're coming in. So you don't want those up all the time. And by the way, this is not a doomsday scenario, right? This is like, this is what happens in the worst circumstances when we're doing nothing for long periods of time. Okay, so it's not like, oh my goodness, this is not, this is not overly deterministic, but it's what's going on when the stress system doesn't come down. Um, inflammation is one of the most active areas of research right now in all of the chronic diseases that are disproportionately affecting people who've had hard lives. Elevated, persistent and elevated inflammation increases atherosclerosis. It accelerates the rate at which you're likely to get heart disease, hypertension, stroke, or some of these sounding familiar for, for populations that are facing serious adversity. Um, and it's associated with uh, major depressive disorders. So um, acutely, it's great. Chronically, it increases the risk. It doesn't mean you're gonna get these diseases and as an individual, but it means population level is a higher risk. Metabolic regulation, acute situation, fantastic. Your energy stores are mobilized. If they stay up for prolonged periods of time and your blood sugar stays up, it puts a strain on the metabolic systems. So you develop insulin resistance, you're more likely to get diabetes. You're more likely to kind of have a variety of metabolic problems that can also affect uh, cognitive decline as you get older. So the stress system is our friend, it's life-saving. It can turn into one of the greatest threats to our learning, our behavior, and our physical and mental health if it's activated all of the time. That's what we mean by toxic stress. The epigenetic effects, I'll just kind of tell you briefly, this is a very esoteric area of, of research, but you should know about it. So this is, it's, it's actually mind blowing. At the molecular level, we're beginning to understand um, how the environment actually affects uh, genes. So not all of these genes that we have, they don't, they're not an automatic pilot. They're all regulated by the environment. And so whether it be stress, whether it be exposure to pollution, whether it be exposure to toxins, how does that actually affect your health and well-being? It actually goes on and it turns, it increases the likelihood of turning certain genes on and turning certain genes off. And if your stress system is very activated most of the time when you're very young, remember, biology is trying to adapt to your environment. The message is the world is a dangerous place. It's not safe, it's very unpredictable. I better have my stress system on, on a fast alert and not because bad things can happen anytime. So it gets set. Think of this as your stress thermostat. It gets set and it triggers for the rest of your life at a lower level 
of activation. All these things are happening early on. But now let's get to the good news, okay? Because there is a real thing called resilience, right? This is not woe is us. And this is why I'm beginning to kind of try to paint a picture of how, not that all of the answers are in science, but this ought to affect how we think about what should we be doing? How can we develop some new ideas about what we should be doing, particularly for very young kids? So um, if you think about the concept of, of risk factors on the left side, that increase the risk for negative outcomes and protective factors on the right side that increase the likelihood of positive outcomes. Generally speaking, on average, none of us is without risk factors in our lives. Um, very few people have no protective factors in their lives. And basically, if you got more protective factors than risk factors, it'll tilt in the positive direction. So we're not that fragile, right? We're not, we're not that fragile. Um, and again, this is a, a schematic, okay? And, and the, the negative fact outcomes, the risk factors, you know, racism, poverty, exposure to violence, addictions, exposure to toxins in the environment. Positive outcomes, there have been so much research on resilience. What is it? How do we understand resilience? People have studied it in the face of poverty, in the face of war, in the face of genocide, in the face of serious mental illness in a family. And one thing always pops out in every study as the first thing on the list of what explains why some kids do well and don't have problems. And that is responsive, supportive relationships. Nobody makes it on their own. Um, be wary of a person who's had a very difficult life, who's put up on a podium and say, look at this person. This person had grit. This person overcame all of that. Um, and so everybody else should model that. Nobody makes it on your own. There's always a relationship, and it isn't necessarily always in the family. Okay? Um, but there are other factors that are protective in the face of adversity, and they speak to the work that you folks do every day. And I'm not making this up. I'm not pandering to a, a place-oriented audience. Um, supportive services where you live. Um, a robust sense of social capital, this kind of intangible thing about a sense of belonging and membership in the community in which you live where there's a kind of a sense of trust and a sense of the fact that, that people are there for you. And actually there's a lot of work. Oh, that got messed up. Faith and cultural traditions also are very often associated with protective factors. So there's a lot we can do in the face of significant adversity to prevent the consequences of toxic stress. It is not an overly determined sense, but we've got to do something about that, right? Now, the other thing is the individual differences issue. So this represents, let's say, about 80% of the population, 80 to 85% of the population is relatively primed to be resilient. But about 15% of the population um, are just um, constitutionally more sensitive. Um, their kids who are just in a tough environment are going to be more likely to kind of um, have problems in regulating their stress system. And why has that survived through evolution? Because in a positive environment, those kids are more creative than the average kid, um, because they are more sensitive to what's going on around them. Um, and so this is a notion that, again, it's a, a symbol. The, the fulcrum is switched for some kids. You can even have lots of protective factors, um, but still end up with negative outcomes because you're more sensitive. But it's not fixed. You can increase that resilience by strengthening adaptive skills, by modeling and coaching in, in families and in programs and helping kids build those skills that then allow them to be more resilient. It's not fixed. So I'm gonna kind of finish up now with a couple of take home messages. How do we take all this fancy molecular biology and turn it into what kind of principles could we bring to wherever we work in whatever sector that could increase impacts in terms of positive educational outcomes? You know, and it's three simple principles and that none of them will surprise you. One is to focus on supporting responsive relationships between adults and children, it's critical. The second is helping to strengthen core skills in context. This is a very controversial area right now. A lot of our child development research has been based mostly on white middle class populations studied by graduate students in universities, right? And deciding what are the skills that kids need. And it doesn't take into account that there are some very positive adaptive skills that children develop in more threatening environments that need to be seen as assets, okay? So we need to be very clear about what we mean by skills and coping mechanisms, but they're real and they need to be built. 
And the third is reduced sources of stress. You could look at that and say, thanks a lot, Big Shot, so tell me something. And, so, and this is no great new discovery. But here's the message I want to leave you with. We have to acknowledge that the devil's in the details. Yeah, we know these are important, but how do you do it? How do you strengthen relationships? How do you build skills? How do you reduce stress? This is where you can't just focus at the family level. And the issue is not just how, but when. When is the clock ticking and are we kind of dealing with a situation where it's gonna to be tougher? Um, so I'm gonna leave you with two examples that I don't want to equate, this is gonna be about leukemia, the next slide is about Apple computer. I'm not equating leukemia with racism and, or poverty, but there's a very important message to be learned from this, a lesson that we ought to take. About, for me, the issue is how do we increase the impact of what we're doing? How do we get to population level change much more than we do now, not just individual programs? So in 1964, the five-year survival rate for acute leukemia in children, which is the most common form of cancer in children, was 3%. So it was basically a fatal disease. 97% of the children didn't live past five years. And the year after that was the first year of Head Start. And in the first couple of years of Head Start, the average effect size of Head Start was a quarter of a standard deviation. 10 years later, the five-year survival rate for leukemia was 60%, and the average effect size for Head Start was a quarter of a standard deviation. Still an evidence-based program, still making an improvement. Um, this is actually now 15 years old. Even then, the survival rate went to nine, over 90%, and the average effect size for Head Start was a quarter of a standard deviation. Still an effective program, but not getting more and more effective. And now the survival rate is over 95%. Um, how do we explain the progress? Is there anything to be learned? Yes. In the last 25 to 30 years, there hasn't been one new treatment developed for acute leukemia in children. Not one new treatment. How did we make this progress? People start to say, well, there are different kinds of vari variations of this leukemia, different types, different subtypes. And if we look at all the treatments we have, instead of just looking at the average effect, let's start to find out which ones work best for different subtypes. And all of a sudden, the, the survival rate was dramatically improving. The message here was there's no one treatment for leukemia. Why are we still in 2022 asking what's the best program for kids in poverty? What's, what's the best program for children who are experiencing the stresses of racism? Okay, that, unless we get away from what's the best, everybody's mentioned it, no silver bullets, stuff like that, but there are ways to get better and better by understanding variability in the population. Tremendously important. Um, Apple, okay, 30 years of game-changing achievements at Apple. Here's the message. So in 1976, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak uh, invented a prototype of a personal computer in a garage in Palo Alto. And the next year they incorporated it into a company. And I'm just I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but um, six years later, they developed a, a, a personal computer named Lisa for a kind of mass production, and it was a colossal flop. Um, the year after that, the Macintosh was released, a big iconic commercial, and so they had some breakthrough. And then there was a period, now we're talking about 15 years after the personal computer was invented, they came out with a, like a, a, a handheld computer, a little handheld computer um, called the Apple Newton, and it was a total flop. And the next year they came out with a, a game, a kind of a video game called Pippin, that was a total flop. Um, and then a few years after that, the iMac was developed, and then in a period of of nine years, the, the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad were released, okay. Is there a message here? Well, first off, um, they didn't, when the, when the handheld device flopped, that wasn't the time they said, why don't we try to make an iPhone? They've been working on that for like 20 years, right? And the, the, the lesson here from this and from all of these breakthrough companies, which is really the lesson for our field is, you need a bold vision, you need to be really clear that you're gonna get there. You need to be very strategic about your investments. You need to know when to double down because you're onto something, even if it takes five to 10 years, the issue of please no more three year grants. But also you need to know when to cut your losses and stop trying to make something work when it's not really working. And never lose sight of the fact 
that you'll get there if you learn from failure and learn from what doesn't work. Now, they had the advantage of deep pocket investors and a whole lot of other you know, stuff that was going on in the company. Um, but um, the key thing in all of these breakthroughs is people learn from failure. And, or we can talk about disappointing results. We can use any word we used. Um, but if we continue to just showcase our successes and not look at where are we not making as much of an impact as we want, and ask why, what can we learn from this? What should we do differently? This is where I think uh, very powerful seats at the table are. What can we learn from what science tells us about what influences healthy development and what undermines it? And what's the knowledge of the lived experience of families? What are they, why do they think something's working or not working? What about the people providing the services? What about the policymakers? So I'm gonna leave you with uh, two quotes from Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a Nobel laureate, Nobel Peace Prize, who's the first woman leader of an African country in Liberia. Um, this is just another version of what many people have said very eloquently uh, since last night. Two quotes from uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. The size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. I mean, I think this is so critically important. It's like there is knowledge, there is experience, there are lessons to be learned that are beyond what we're doing right now, and we need to figure out how to access that. And we need to figure out how to bring that into um, the work that we do so we can think in fresh ways and develop some new ideas and test them and double down on the ones that are working and throw out the ones that aren't working and say, so what else could we try? And um, the related quote was, if your dreams do not scare you, they're not big enough. So, so my, my pitch, from, from kind of where I sit in the early childhood space and kind of eager to kind of have not just place-based stuff recognize early childhood, but have early childhood recognize it's limited in what it can do if it doesn't start looking upstream at the broader environment in which people are living. That's, I think that's our marching order from the science point of view. Um, and uh, for any of you who want more information, want to dig deeper into this stuff, this is our website, developingchild.harvard.edu. We've got, we've got videos, we have infographics, we have working papers, we have in-briefs that will basically make a lot of this complicated science uh, very accessible to you, and I'd welcome you to go on there. So thank you again, Jeff. I don't know if you're here, but thank you for the invite. Thank you for inviting me. I jumped at the chance when you called me to be part of this, so thanks very much.